Good morning and welcome to the third day of Paris Men's Fashion Week on Show Studio. Today we're going to talk about Junior Watanabe, um, a, a real designer's designer. Uh, we are missing the fabulous Rob Mayers. He's on his way and he has fantastic hair and amazing opinions. Um, but if the rest of the panel can introduce themselves, Belle. Um, I'm Belle Jacobs, a fashion writer. I'm Peter Jensen, a fashion designer. And I'm Mandy Leonard and I run a fashion consultancy, Mandy's Basement. So I just thought, since Junior is Japanese um, and we haven't really talked much about Japanese fashion this season, I just thought our little preamble could be, you know, what's fan uh, what does Japanese fashion mean to the, the panel? Uh, Peter, mm. perhaps you could tell me your, your, your story, your Japanese fashion. Oh, I have to start. Uh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think the Japanese fashion has a great place in, in fashion. I think they, they're very directional and, and they sort of sit <coughs> for themselves in terms of directing and doing whatever it is that they do. They're not... I always look at it that, that they're not under great pressure of directing, being directed by whatever is going on. They sort of have their own vision and their own aesthetic. And I find that fascinating. Um, and they seem to build solid, good businesses, which I'm, I'm very in awe of. I think that that's a great thing, and they do great collaborations with various people, which are, is, is great. So, so for me, it's okay. I mean, and personally, I, I can say for myself, I, I, my own business has it. We have a great market in Japan. We have a great follow in Japan. So uh, I sort of personally understand <coughs> that kind of side of the business if you like if that makes any sense who and um, perhaps you could fill me in because uh, bizarrely uh, I'll just show off a little bit I had a column for five years in Japanese nylon and I've written for lots of Japanese people probably because I'm a bit spastic and so that when they tra <laughs> when they translate it they don't mind the mistakes but mm -hmm. um, but uh, I've never been so I don't really because you know every the people are big in <coughs> Japan and I, I know that the fan thing, I know the massive respect they have for, mm. for talent, mm. but who is the fashion customer? Who, who are these people that, that go out and buy all this amazing fashion that exists in Japan? Do, do, do you know? I, I, I don't, I mean, I, w I went there a couple of years ago and, and my agent had this big party for me and what was really fun was that they imported a hot dog van and, and Danish beers and they had this big party for me and, and they were like, and then all of a sudden all these 200 girls turned up and I had to sign all these autographs on, on their knickers and all sorts <laughs> of places and, and so it really made me aware that, that uh, that I had this great big follower and, and people were really knowledgeable. They, they, they had a great knowledge, they knew everything about what it is that I personally do and I think that that is uh, typical of, of a Japanese. They, they're very sort of specific, they know quality. I mean they're very quality orientated. They, they very much go into details of if you've made a mistake or, or, or you know, so, so I think that they're very much <coughs> in awe and, and aware of that. So I think that that is the customer base of of, uh, of, a, of a Japanese market. They seem to have real passion for ideas. We were j just talking about Junsuke, um, who was the, uh, his edits magazine called Untitled. And um, they seem, uh, and when I was meeting the, uh, I was doing sales for Ryan Lowe in Paris last season, because Ryan couldn't go. Um, and uh, they, yeah, the, the buyers, the Japanese buyers seem to have real passion for ideas. Did you get that, Mandy? And then, like the Japanese fashion press, they seem to. I don't know. They seem. I think um, the Japanese fashion press that I'm aware of there, they are people like Junsky, who we know. Um, Junsky is a guy that a lot of us, um, a lot of the British London fashion designers know personally. He's an incredible support, and like him, he's passionate about fashion. So they all find themselves mm. in these fashion mm. jobs by default because they're into fashion and they want to work in fashion so they start writing about it. It's a real passion based thing. Anyone that um, we know um, who goes to Tokyo and makes contact with Junsky, he is complete, he's almost like the single handed tourist board for British fashion designers. He completely looks after them. There's a, um, a kind of fashion safari that everyone goes on which is he'll take you to the key stores um, which include things like that amazing um, Neil Barrett store that Zaha Hadid 
has designed you know, all these landmark places, the undercover store, um, and he'll take you to Ambush's studio, which is a recording studio, and their showroom for their jewellery that they do, you know, key figures. Um, and I just think that a lot of the people that I've met that work at Japanese Vogue, they started from this very um, street level fashion interest. The guy, what's the guy, um, the old chap that's the fashion director of Japanese Vogue and Korean Vogue, and he, he's American and he had the shop on Kings Road in <gasps> London. Uh, <clears throat> I, I always get Is he the Beams guy? He's, he's American, he's old, he like had Granny Takes Trip or something. He's oh, best okay. mates with Vivian Westwood, he's... Also, uh, but, um, uh, Belle, perhaps you can rescue me from my bumbling. Um, oh. What's your relationship with, <laughs> with uh, Japanese fashion? Well, I think um, you can't... Every time I see a, a Japanese fashion show, you can't forget the impact they made when they burst onto the scene in the 80s and how influential they were in the Western fashion market, completely reconsidering the, uh, their ideas about fashion. And I did do a bit of reading. Um, and I, it's the whole principle of deconstruction, reconstruction, I think came from the Japanese designers. Um, the idea of patchwork is so key in Japanese culture. That was a big thing. Um, redefining female sexuality so that it's not just about the well, beautiful. So, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Patchwork. That's amazing. Yeah. Because uh, that obviously relates, relates so much to Jin's. Uh, Junya. Yes. And perhaps uh, Jun Takahashi too. Yes. Um, please explain. Well, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's this technique called boro, which is actually short for boro boro, and it's it's what the Japanese peasants used to do instead of, well, they couldn't simply afford to buy a new jacket, but if they had a jacket, they would simply, and it broke or it tore, they would put a little patchwork on. And they would keep doing this for sort of 10 years, 20 years. So at the end, this is sort of the in, in the 1800s, you would get really phenomenal patchwork pieces, curiously often dyed in indigo dyes. So if you look at them, they look, uh, look like intricate sort of denim pieces, really. And they were sort of shift trousers and sort of little open jackets. And it's a hugely influential technique within Japanese culture. Um, um, Japanese fashion. Um, when you see patchwork done by Japanese designer, it almost is a cultural reference to this very ancient technique that they've they're drawing from. So that's what patchwork means for me in Japanese wow. fashion. Yeah, it was fantastic, and it's called borrow, which was an amazing word. Um, but there you go. Yeah. No, that's great. That's, yeah, that's it's really interesting. Because the Junya collection for men, not the last collection, was it spring summer two thousand and thirteen? That was very Eastern European influence, where yeah. it looked like oh, yes. the clothes were patched on top yeah. of each other yes. and worn, and had that kind of um, family heritage. Mm. Yes. The other thing that I love about the Japanese, sort of the history of the Japanese culture, is the fantastic focus they used to place on workwear. So um, it's almost like the beginnings of our interest in very functional clothing. Um, and also in Japanese design, there was the idea of. I identity where the uniform, the way it adapts to you, is actually more expressive of your individuality than completely different pieces. So if you wear a uniform, you wear it consistently over and over again, it starts to take on the mark of the person who wears it. And in a way, it's a very subtle showing of who you are. It's a very, it's, it was a fantastic Well, well sort I of think theory. people have commented about that, um, about that with the British school uniform as well. Yeah. It's yeah. our tradition of subverting you know, and we, us yes. and the Japanese have the school uniform in common. Yes. That also reminds me of um, labels well. like um, Neighbourhood and Double Taps about how they're inspired by original biker wear and work wear. Um, the and denim reference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Mr. Rob Mayers, you're Hi. here. Hi. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to pick him up. Just it's very difficult. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I can't get the clip on. Can we start? Yeah, if you can do. Sorry, ever causing a drama. There, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Rob, this is Belle Jacobs. Yeah. Hi. Rob Mayers, <laughs> and this is Peter Jensen. Hello. Hi. And you know Mandy, obviously. Hi. <laughs> um, um, welcome to the panel. We're thank just you. discussing what Japanese fashion means to us. So perhaps you'd like to join in. I'm sure you've got some good ideas. Um, Japanese fashion for me. Um, 
an importance of craft uh, and the how craft influences how the craft kind of works into street culture. I think street culture is a huge part of Japanese fashion. I think it's it, where it, where it evolves and the uh, use of uh, history and kind of Jap uh, traditional Japanese styles and how that works through street style. Yeah, Bell was just blowing our mind with some design history details. <laughs> well, my my Which small mind. To what you said. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. not country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mandy, sorry, you were also talking about... I was just talking about um, the kind of culture of labels I really love, like Double Taps and Neighbourhood, um, uh, the way that they're inspired by um, biker culture and the Middle America bikers, and they're almost every collection <coughs> they do is almost like doing a kind of classic button-down shirt, but the next version that's even better, um, that kind of thing. I think it's... It's a little bit, sometimes as a fashion journalist, it <coughs> saddens me, Japan saddens me, because um, Japanese, being very modest people, they, they often can speak English one-on-one, -on -one but don't like to in interviews. So I think we, we actually lose a lot of brilliant fashion in the West, because mm -hmm. it's very hard to secure an interview with mm -hmm. a Japanese designer. Um, you know, uh, I had to interview John Takahashi through translators, I had to interview Ray through email, um, and the small designers are missed. And I had um, our friend Junski, who used to be the editor of Japanese Days and was then the editor of Japanese Vogue Japan, uh, do a sort of a young designer thing. And some of the ideas were just mind blowing. He did a young designer, Tokyo young designer. He did a guy called Miki, Mikio Sabe, who did sort of that Akihabara girl, the kind of. Um, you know those, it's actually boys dressed as girls that they have when they launch anything to do with computers. There's this really weird thing, because in Japan you have a lot of mega nerds who all they do is play on computers all day. Mm. Some of them, there's like thousands of people that live at home and never leave the house. A lot of them go to the arcades in yeah. Tokyo and just sit there all day. The businessmen, they sat on the um, games and they've got <coughs> the briefcase by the side of the... Well, they have a fashion week for this part of Tokyo mm. called Akihabara Fashion Week, which is the nerd uh, place. And so there was one designer that based a collection on these sort of boys dressed as in girl doll suits that launch all the computer stuff. And then there was another designer that Junsky told us about called um, Written Afterwards that just based an entire collection on sort of being mm. God. And like, you know, and had like these guys with like, that, well, it was women with like big white beards and stuff. And just this like insane diversity of ideas that just kind of get missed because we're, you know, because of that, that wall. Like Carrie sort mm. of said, it's the nearest we have to aliens, Japan, which, which I like. As Doesn't that make it kind of special though? Yeah. I kind of yeah. like the fact that when it can't be completely exposed to us, you know, it's kind of, it makes it, it can't be overexposed in certain ways, it can't be commercialised, it keeps it special, you know, so mm. much is kind of like put out there and exposed in that way that those glimpses that you get become like little bits of gold, mm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like it used to be like that, but now I think it is a lot more commercial and maybe the secrets aren't there. You don't have to travel to Tokyo to discover these secrets yeah. like you, you, you used to. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I feel like obviously, um, you know, Japan totally made streetwear, you know, like you couldn't have our streetwear culture without Japan's weird take on American culture. Um, but I feel like in the high design end, you have this sort of uh, dichotomy between the Com Empire, Yoji, the legacy of Kenzo and Issy, and then you've got all these young designers that we're just not, they're just not coming through and we're not hearing about. Um, I think there's some unwritten support that um, Ray Karakubo does to a lot of designers there. I mean, obviously Dover Street Market is in Ginza and the, the, like in London they support a lot of young designers coming through from quite early, you know, when they've just graduated. Mm. But I have heard stories of Ray helping out fellow designers in Tokyo. It's amazing because she obviously Junior is her protégé yeah. and I love I love this, uh, maybe it's more of a creative idea than a purely fashion idea, but I love this idea of having proteges and making yes. them happen instead of jealously guarding your own success. I think that's kind of what Nicholas Kirkwood's doing at the moment with Sophia Webster as well. I mean, she was working for Nicholas 
um, and she obviously was doing had her own signature and was doing this really strong thing and he's he's mentoring her they're very much supporting her mm -hmm. they're helping her incredibly with business I mean if I had a business and someone who worked for me in the design studio kind of sprung out mm. I kind of feel a little bit threatened but <laughs> they've kind of made it in this into this really strong uh, marriage mm. I think there is a tradition of, of pass of patronage though isn't in, uh, in Japanese culture and Jonya isn't the only one isn't there Tao, Tao Kurihara a young woman that um, Ray has patronized as well and who's starting to emerge and then that's then the label in oh is that the Comme de Garcon Tao label uh, it could be yeah it must um, be and then there's Sakai as well which is very big the the Japanese label Sakai in Comme de Garcon which is a, a growing sort of labels a young woman again I think that's one of Ray's protégés so it's a yeah it's a really lovely idea this the sense of handing a baton I think Junior said that everything he knows he learned from Ray well they're very um, I notice when you work with Japanese people you know uh, when you have a problem it's never a conflict it's always mm. the, <coughs> we're just gonna sort it out mm. so you know mm. um, they're, they're amazingly forgiving mm. Mm. now there's also a, there's a there's an, another element to the working relationship that that's not as there's some element not everything's amazing you know it's mm. a different culture some things are good some things are bad but the good thing is definitely this idea that when you have a problem instead of it becoming a conflict yeah. it becomes this is how we're going to sort it out yeah. and and I found that amazingly supportive it's it's a really attractive humility um, I think um, the Japanese sort of psyche is is fascinating because in one format is very much about communality and working as a team and subsuming the individual to the greater good but there's also particularly in fashion a sense of great individuality you know in the street style everyone is a very strong character uh, it's a fantastic tension and it has great sort of results visually culturally everything yeah but I've it's heard wonderful. that Ray works completely secluded. Yes, I've heard stories it, that yeah. she works completely. She doesn't. She works in the centre of her design studio, yes. but it's curtained, so she can just be yes. do what she does, which is kind of amazing. But yes. it's almost like she chooses <laughs> yes. who gets to see how she works or into yes. her mindset. But there's also a sense where she is very collaborative. So she's very individual and wants. Yeah. But she's very collaborative. I read somewhere, and forgive me if I'm. But she wanted a new fabric, um, and instead of giving a brief to the fabric designer, she just gave him a crumpled piece of paper and said to him, take from that. And so he had to go away and go, okay, what does this mean? For an, and, and so there's a great sense of collaboration and passing over, and like I said before, humility, lack of sense of self, on the, uh, at the same time as being very, you know, yeah, working yeah. in individual, you know, in isolation, and it's, yeah, I it's think I love, the fact, I love the fact as well that it feels very much like you, you see the way in which she designs and the way in which, you know, kind of other Japanese designers uh, design and for me it almost feels like when you first start at art school mm. and there are no rules yeah you know and it's completely you're not defined by line or shape or fabric and it's just kind of a feeling you know like when you're a kid and you're just it's just let it be what it is as opposed to it has to fit this it has to be this product it has to be you know in this material I think it's it's so open in how it's designed What's, what's this difference? Peter, perhaps you could shed some light on it. There's, you know, there's the 1970s issy, you know, mental, futurist shapes, the kind of, uh, that whole kind of Japanese Godzilla bullet train mm. kind of thing, you know, uh, um, Japan future take over the universe, right? There's that. Uh, and then there's, there's this kind of weird vintage shop with modern details line. So, you know, he, Jung Takash, Takahashi has both going on in his head. So, you know, when he art directs a fashion shoot, there'll be sort of lasers coming out, but they're coming out of a lace doll that, that looks really vintage. And a lot of their clothes look quite vintage and almost have this kind of, it's like this, you know, and sometimes com is just like a brown b brogue rather than some mad dress. <coughs> what what is that? It's like it's almost like clothes for sort of an imaginary Denmark, like a kind of like Denmark. yeah, like a vintage, a vintage kind of social democratic mm. paradise of moomins. 
<laughs> which are Finnish. But um, I know. So but I, know. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. But that's. Um, God, I don't know how to answer that question because I'm. I I, I don't really know. But I I, I think I think. Going back to what you were saying, I, I, f I think that there's something in the in the Japanese culture that they're very faithful in the way that they work. That it's not, you know, the, the, the workers l leave the office not before the main person leaves the office. So yeah, if yeah, the main yeah. person leaves the office at two o'clock in the morning, the workers will still be there working. I don't think that that exists in the Western culture. You know, you would have people moaning and complaining that they would be hanging around. So, so I think that that has a, a like you know you're talking about her working in this yeah. reclusive area of of the street. I mean, I think that that reflects also of how the quality emerge in in Japanese design and and, mm. and in that kind of a, a cultural cultural way. There, there's a, there's another way of approaching I think work aesthetic in Japan than there is in the in in the Western. Uh, uh, culture. I mm. don't know if that makes any sense. And and I and and I, d I do think that d talking about Junior Watanabe and and the Spring Summer, I think that he there was a lot of Scandinavian influence of the fisherman bag. Mm. Uh, the, mm. the, the the sort of they seem to they, they do seem to go for that kind of Arne Jakobsen Scandinavian furniture aesthetic when when they when they. Um, Look, look at design philosophy or, or design uh, development, and I know that they that has a big market in Japan as well. Well, you know, we talk about this idea of secret luxury constantly, but they really do it. Yes. You know, I mean, mm. it really, d you know, unless you went up close, you you wouldn't know it's ex you know a mm. lot of uh, mm. Junior's menswear is designed to right. almost yeah. look like it that, could that's be. That's what I love about Porter, brands like Porter. Yeah. Um, best bags in the world, the most incredible quality, whereas most people in in kind of Western fashion don't really know about Porter, but yeah. if you own a Porter bag, you can walk down the street mm. and feel incredibly smug because you're wearing something that's just as incredible quality as Nermo's bag. Mm. Mm. Um, I think, yeah. I think also you were talking about brogues and, oh sorry Peter, um, no. you were talking about brogues and one of the things I've noticed about recent collections from Junya is um, the reference to Americana, I think he had a big love affair with Americana for a while. Um, one of the more recent collections was very British, very tweedy, very, um, I've always been fascinated by the way um, the East views the West. Um, and how it takes its ideas and interprets them. I, I, do, I, I still can't quite work out the relationship between them. I grew up in Hong Kong and I spent an enormous time, amount of time watching Japanese cartoons that were very definitely set in some kind of European state with their very blonde heroines with their enormous dinner plate blue eyes. And there's a sense of like, I don't know if they want to, it, reinterpret it, own it, reach out to it. I don't know how commercially driven that is. It's it's just a, it's a really fascinating relationship. It's, it's a uh, passing to and fro of. I read this piece about what's Hiroshi's surname. You know, Fujiwara. Yeah. So I read this piece about Hiroshi Fujiwara because he had the shop with he had the Seminole Streetwear shop um, with John. And they they used to sell that in Jones in the eighties. Oh yeah. wow! And um. He was talking about how Japanese culture is an island, and the same with Britain, it's an island. So the reason why those two cultures were so creative was because they were cut off, oh, yeah. but seeing it. So they had the space to do their own weird interpretation of it, but it wasn't ever quite right. Yeah. But that's what you like about it, the not quite right element. Yeah, yeah definitely. Which, yeah, is inter interesting. Um, so maybe we should look at the uh, collection then. Yeah. That would be fantastic. And it's weird because he'll just do like a collection that's all tailoring one season and mm. then he'll just sort of do dungarees the next. And uh, obviously there's But there is always a good suit jacket, isn't there? Mm. In Junior Watanabe, I always find there is always... Boiled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> Apparently he has a, I didn't know okay. about this, but he has a sort of a ongoing relationship with Brooks Brothers. Okay. The American sort of suit company. Well, this patchwork denim, I mean, right. his patchwork yeah. denim for the women's collection was has been absolutely massive, hasn't it? And yeah. he's doing it again for the men now. And I think it was interesting because with that patchwork denim, which um, everybody is now familiar with, um, on the front row, all the shows, all the women's fashion mm. editors were, were wearing them, the handbags, everything. Mm. Actually, the black on black was never available in the stores to buy, okay. so that's still something that they could bring to retail. Right, the yes. Patch, the Which denim. That'd be nice. Mm. Peter, what are your There's a lot thoughts? of sort of jackets over the shoulders this season, isn't there? I mean, there was in Louis Vuitton yesterday and, and things like so that. I think that looks very chic, actually. This hair is quite fun as well. Isn't yeah, it? it's brilliant. It was also smart to begin with, and I'm really glad that he's brought in that kind of like punkier element into it. Mm. But what are you saying about the Brooks Brothers as well? Like, aren't mm. the the large percentage of the denims are produced with Levi's, which really? I think is quite amazing. Yeah, like it is such a, a collaboration with Levi's, which I think is great. God, it's amazing you can get anything done not in like five year time scale. And the bags in the patch were, were a collaboration with Ueve as well. So there's still lots of reference to heritage, isn't there? All the quilted jackets and the... So it's quite funny as well, because um, I'm not the biggest junior fan, you know, hearing Loewe, Loewe, Levi's, Brooks Brothers, this guy's important, more important than perhaps as a menswear designer than perhaps people think at first. I think that he's hugely important for men. So I think that he has a hugely big truth, I mean, a market within the menswear. I mean, you can see him, he's selling to a cool store like Goodhood in, in Shoreditch, for instance. I mean, they buy his outerwear. So, so it's obviously he has a big sort of retail kind of, you know. But you know what's really lovely about that? Yes. A store like Goodhood is really independent and it's run by lovely people and they've got n Neighbourhood and some of those mm. brands that I love that are yeah. Japanese. But actually a store like that can't buy many pieces. So it's, it's I don't mean this is a patronising, but it's very sweet that he would sell to a shop like that because they're not going to be, be able to buy a big volume. Mm. I think it's nice they have to pick it well, you know, they have to really. Right have the like, think about what they're taking in yeah but I think that's the problem with a lot of the big brands though if you don't reach their minimum orders you aren't you aren't able to buy them for your store mm. there's a yeah. lot of demands on smaller retailers that's why a lot of them are being edged out because they have to buy minimums they have to buy certain pieces and and actually with some people they have to cover the collections really well if the designer does, doesn't feel that you're buying their collection properly mm. they can put demands on you I think what I love about Junior as well is the fact that even though we're saying you know this is very heritage and it's very smart, what I wear it a lot and mm. I wear it in a very streetwear way, mm. you know, and in, in in that type of it, it can come out like this, but I can see pieces there that mm. you know I'll put on with a hoodie and a pair of Vans. Do you know what I mean? Like it's kind of it's it. I think it's very telling of his style that it transcends something that can be formal or something that can be a streetwear piece. What do you, what sort of pieces do you wear, Rob? Um, I love it when a wearer comes on. <laughs> yeah, the top mini skirt. Right. <laughs> the top mini skirt I, that, that we're doing. Um, I love the patchwork stuff. I'm so glad it's yes. come for boys. I'm so, so glad it's come for boys. Um, I will be all over that. Um, a lot of my male friends have actually bought the women's. Okay. I wish they'd fit me. <laughs> Literally, I wish they'd fit me. But then that's another thing that we were saying about Japanese designers. They, it comes in such tiny sizes. Okay. That's always like, especially, you know, when you wear it in a certain way, you know, you can't like, we spoke about like double taps and things like that before. And yeah, like I think that people forget that in Tokyo, it, it, the, the normal sizes are small and medium, yeah. but they're quite small, small and medium. Yeah. Mm. So when you come to the West, a large isn't really large. A large is like medium. A large is a medium, yeah. So it's like all the fits are so, like very, you know, the Japanese fits are so small. So um, I mean, I think, you know, brands like Com and like uh, Junior are aware of that. And so, you know, they do fit that well. So I'm very happy with patchwork jeans, the patchwork's coming through. And all the, I love the padding, you know, the, um, uh, the quilted, the quilted jackets under mm. the blazers that are coming out, I think look great. 
for me, what say what what brings it together is the styling and the hair. Yeah. Um, I love the kind yeah. of punk and almost plastic Bertrand feel of that styling. And again, you've got the stripy sweater that makes it really punky. So mixing that in, for yeah. me, it brings it alive without that. Um, because I, I, I always feel that the women's and men's is so far apart. Okay, they've got the patchwork and everything, but the women's, for me, it is when there's a women's show, I get really, really excited about it, but when there's a men's show, less so, and I find it almost quite puny. You know, the models are very, very skinny. There's not, you know, they're not, whereas this collection looks looks quite strong. Mm. It's got that punk sensibility. The the um, mohair sweaters in the loose knit are mm. brilliant. It's much more abrasive than anything he's done for quite a long time, mm. isn't it? It wasn't at the beginning, it's getting more so now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're right. Yeah, this section's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's fab. We can definitely see a massive, you know, a, a Western, you know, it feels like there's a huge kind of London punk thing, you know, like we were saying earlier about the kind of the Eastern take on Western culture and things mm. like that. Yeah. Well, Peter, you like a good bit of knitwear. How, how are you feeling about these jumpers? Well, I do like a good bit of knitwear, and I do think it looks really great and, and mm. very well done. And mm. it's, but I, th I think if I were to wear it, I would probably look ridiculous. But, <laughs> but that's just my. But but you know, but no, it, it looks it looks amazing, and I think it, it it'll look great on the on the right body and the right person and, and with the right styling and and, and you know, yeah, no, it always. You know, it's kind of fantastic, of course. I, I'm not. I'm, I have to admit, I'm not keen on, on those big ties. That, that's that's not. Yeah. Oh uh, right, yeah. <laughs> okay. But it's funny, isn't it? Because those ties, they don't look silly. They kind of look okay. Okay, you wouldn't wear it like that. But they don't look silly. No. Well. They kind of add something to it. For the, I think, for the benefit of the show. I love that slash from Kiss, frizzy hair. Oh yeah. See, I love this, the, on 42, the messy Angora. Yeah. That's and that's amazing, like, because it was all, you know, like a very obvious, like, you know, uh, Sid Vicious stripe and, you know, then like the kind of open knits. But I love this kind of broken patchwork. Yes. Knit. That's actually the tie, it's, it's slightly, it's see-through, isn't it? Because we can oh, see the tie, the tie underneath. underneath. The knee. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Maybe yeah. that's why the tie is there, just to reiterate that. Just to that. kind of come yeah. through with the, with the knits. Yeah. But it's great with a collection like this that it's almost like it's one idea, isn't it? That's really been taken through. So, so you yeah. you can really go away and, and you it's sort of like just sits in your head. You totally remember what it is that it's about. If you had to sort of say it within a few words, you know what what the end result of that collection would be. I mean, that must be easy for a journalist mm. to write about. Well, well he's definitely a, a designer you, that ha each collection is, you know quite different. Right. I mean it might not, not so much in menswear I find. No, I think well, it might relate to the same themes, but each collection mm. has a definite identity. But no. I, I, yeah. I do always think that there is patchwork. Like last season wasn't there like patchwork on his yeah. blazers? That's what Mandy yeah. was yeah. talking yeah. about. Like you said actually yeah. patchwork was this season on top before of patchwork. Last. Yeah. So the is that the last look, forty three? Okay. No, I think that show really came alive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I really love it. Yeah. I really love when a designer designs to a theme and it's kind of clean, you know, even if it's a few completely different references. Mm. I think I really, you know, what you were saying about there being like a look to a collection. Yeah. I really, really like that. I think a lot of times, I think sometimes young designers design with too many themes. I think yeah. there are a few that do it amazingly, but I, I really love it when a designer takes a theme and mm just goes ham with it, do mm. you know what I mean? And just like looks into every facet they possibly can of mm. it. And even if it's, you know, polar opposites in a theme, mm. it's very easy to kind of like see it and you get a feeling for a collection, mm. as opposed to, well, I did this because I liked it. Mm. You know, I think it's really nice when it's kind of so strong in its theme. The hair's great. The hair's great. I do find that with Junior though, his, he, he, he does take a very specific, he's very, very focused and it's kind of one or two ideas which are then really examined throughout mm. the catwalk show, as opposed to the Westwood where I felt that there were four or five ideas that were, were played with. Um, and that focus is fantastic for really investigating and looking and... Very similar to Comme des Garçons as yeah. well, you know, she'll bring out 
um, a permutation and then then yeah. literally it's like 20 hour outfits later it's like okay we've got yes. it <laughs> yes yes it's a kind of concentration that we don't have so much in this in this culture nowadays that that ability to just like really um, well concentrate on, on an idea and I, I love this collection I think it's really thrilling and commercial I was going to use the word commercial which is a bit of a dirty word but it, you know, January, January, is January is best. You know that in the store it's going to sell, it's got a strong identity, yeah. it hasn't shifted too much from what he usually does, but I think it's a strong one. And maybe, you know, his winter collections are stronger anyway in general when you look back over them. Yeah. We're, we're pro, co well, I, 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 I feel pro commerce. It's good. I mean, there's yeah. no point designing for yeah. yourself. Yeah, without being commercially successful, you probably don't survive. And then, you kind of. But yeah, I love it. I think it's great. It's quite interesting also the intersection between men's and women's wear, you know, bringing the patchwork design for, you know, into women's wear and then now these jeans here as well. He did do a show though um, last year. Um, I think it was a show in Japan that wasn't publicised that much. Um, and it was to almost la launch the collaboration. It was mainly focusing on the patchwork and it was men's and women's and there were men and women in that show. But I'm not sure what the purpose of that show was. It was was one that people that I know in London who work with the designer weren't too familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look, you can see it. Mm. And it, it was a lot of this punk styling as well then. Right, right. So who was uh, Peter, was it you talking about, um, to tune into that punk styling that Mandy's mentioning, uh, Peter, was it you talking about deconstruction earlier? Or was it you, Bell? <laughs> I mentioned ideas of deconstruction. Yeah, just because, you know, I don't know, I think that's interesting with the punk thing and the, uh, there's so much of it in Japanese design. I don't know, maybe there's not so much in this show, but... What, right now or...? or, or traditionally. Well, traditionally. Traditionally. I mean, their, their, yeah. their relationship with deconstruction is much older than ours isn't it? Mm. Which is quite interesting. Yeah, I think Japanese designers, we take it for granted now, but the whole idea of um, asymmetric clothing, you know, yeah. where a colour is yeah. different. That has completely stemmed from Yoji, Comme des Garçons, yeah. Fujiwara. And we should also mention uh, Kanzai Yamamoto, who just had his um, fashion in motion at the V&A. Yeah. Um, I'm involved in this, um, it's an inter international fashion support initiative in London that's set up by the British Fashion Council and the British Council, and they they um, contact embassies all over the world to bring fashion to London at London Fashion Week um, for the public and Fashion Week to see. And actually, Kanzai Yamamoto is curating the Japanese one this season, and some of the designers they've got coming are very exciting. Wow. Yeah, it's the new wave because these are very these are designers that have only just graduated or are about to graduate. That's amazing that Kansai Yamamoto is pulling that. I know. Someone has been so famous for I can't contain myself. <laughs> you know, such huge, you know, like, you know, such famous Bowie looks and that's yeah. I'm intrigued to see the type of things that he wants now, you know. I think the other thing we don't we haven't talked about yet is um, technical innovation within Japanese fashion. I think Yun Yun Junya was one of you know the people who really pushed forward. They worked directly with textile designers to create really, really um, technical fabrics. And it's one thing that we can't get a sense of when we just look at something on a screen. Um, but if we went into that show and we felt stuff and we looked at stuff, uh, some of it probably would be really surprising. Even though it looks like quite a sensible navy jacket in look one, we might find something amazing about that. There's also, they do linings as well. The linings are often very innovative. There's always something yeah. amazingly futuristic about I think also one of the things that you're probably describing is the fact that they innovate with materials yeah. that are uh, um, nylon type fibres, fibres yeah, that we wouldn't true. traditionally regard as luxury. Mm. Yes. Um, the idea of you know, these kind of heavy viscose type materials yes. and making them beautiful. Um, and then like you say, with the linings and the fabrics, the way that they're treated, it's incredible, isn't it? Yes. And also you should commend um, 
Comme de Garçon and Janja because they weave their own materials. It's not mm. like they pick the fabrics. They're actually making and weaving these fabrics yeah. themse mm. themselves. They've got the facility to do that. I think Miyaki, the men's show recently, he did an amazing sort of, it looked like, I couldn't work it out from the screen, but it was like a blue bottle, like the body of an insect. It was an incredible sheen on his bomber jackets, which I'd not seen before. Um, which is another example, sort of innovation in, in textiles. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it was beautiful, really. Oh, thank you very much. So, I have from the ever, Eva, uh, two questions: one from Japan, mm. and one from the countryside. So first, we'll take the question from Japan uh, to our friend Junsuke. Because although there's 120 million Japanese people, he's, he's the only <laughs> one that Was I Jansky, emailed. Did Jansky publish your book? Because uh, he published Matthew Stone's he book, did didn't Matthew's he? He did Matthew's book, that, yeah, that I designed. Oh, yours is yeah. Trolley, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's, it, Jansky says, it's too broad to define like this, but apparently his men were, menswear is made for daily use more than his women's wear is. Mm. Does everyone think he creates for his menswear line each season? or just ref refreshing heritage in his own way? If the latter, do you think his menswear line is creative? Rob, I'll, I'll ask you. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's creative. I think that's what a designer does every season. They take, you, they find influences and you know, you have certain themes that you return to and I think mm. that you know the heritage thing and the certain elements that he has he returns to because that's his tastes you know it's not like we would have no interest if he changed it every season you know w w if it was so completely different every season you know you as as a designer you you get a style um, and I think that he works within that amazingly and you know like we were saying about technical innovations within fabrics and things like that that's how he's moving it forwards and making it more interesting and kind of um, doing something that is a creative shift, I suppose. You're refining it every season as well, yeah. aren't you? Which what is what every designer's doing. You're refining your, you know, a jacket that you thought was the ultimate jacket last season. You're going to be, you don't want that. You don't even want mm -hmm. to repeat. A designer doesn't want to repeat what they've already done either. They want to move forward the whole time. I think designers are paranoid about putting out the same thing, wouldn't you say, Peter? Yes, probably. Yeah. yeah. Probably. A lot of people I know who are designers, by the time of their show, they've seen it so much that they can't bear the sight of it anymore and they can't wait to start designing <laughs> the next <laughs> collection. P? Oh, sorry, I've, I've gone. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I think that, that, that bagging up what you were saying about him, that he using the word commercial, I, I, I don't find that a, a rude word okay. within fashion. I find, I find it incredibly nice I, I, re I really like the way and I would look at a show like this and I would think mm. as a buyer as a consumer I would think yes god I, w I would certainly go and buy that collection because I would be well assured that it would sell and let's face it I mean f fashion has to sell it can't just sustain some kind of fantasy of not paying the rent and and we'll I th in that kind of a way so 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 that that is what i think that he does great and i think that that is what actually japanese designers do really great you know mm. that there's a whole package you get incredibly fabrics you get quality and you get the whole um, thing i think the essence of junsky's question might be is the menswear as creative as the women's wear I think it is absolutely. I think, but I think more subtly, isn't it? It's less of a. It's more. But, but know, thank God. Yeah, in a way. and it's a recognition that men essentially are still more conservative mm. consumers of fashion than women. You can't go. You know, he's not J. W. Anderson, the name that comes up a lot, but he really is driving new, you know, shapes in menswear in a way that women's wear, men's wear, women's wear, <laughs> and men's. Yeah, w yeah, women's wear. Yeah, in a way that um, Junior's not, but it's still beautiful. But an everyday guy can't wear yeah. JW, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's you're not in it's a bustier. No, or, or a yeah. one shoulder kimono. And you're, and you're just. <laughs> and, and I'm sat here like <laughs> you're this. You're just such you know an everyday I mean? guy. Like, I can sit here like this and say that. Like, I think the, the fantastic thing about it is yeah. you can wear it, you know, like I was saying earlier, you can wear it, it, it what, 
in different styles you can pick certain you mm. know you can cherry pick from the looks mm. as to what you would wear and how would you would wear it mm. um, I sometimes wonder if there's a pressure on Japanese designers because in the 80s they were really breaking apart shapes and you know Ray's putting huge padding way before uh, Gareth Pugh is doing it, padded sh and we kind of think we, we think oh the Japanese designers they're going to come up with something crazy um, but it's been a long time really since that's happened for some of them. I think Ray still pushes the boundaries quite a lot and Miyaki, but yeah, there's a kind of... Maybe you should mention the Fukushima. Um, yeah, the fact that he was born in oh, Fukushima. Yeah, and, and really, um, I'm not really aware of so many um, of my friends and myself wanting to go to Tokyo at the moment. You know, the, the, the kind of scene feels a little bit stale. <coughs> well, I think, yeah, there was, a, I mean, definitely, what was it, two years ago? It had yeah. a real big effect yeah. on the economy. I mean, they're trying to reboot the economy. There was often much talk about how there were many apocalyptic themes in Japanese culture precisely because of Hiroshima. Yes. I think actually isn't Isimaki, Isi Miyaki from either Nakisaki or Hiroshima. I tried to ask oh. him once in an interview and he didn't like it. Um, <laughs> but there's an idea that, that um, uh, yeah, that Japanese culture, you know, because people's eyeballs melted down their face yeah. and that there's no other country where that's happened, yes. um, that also they have a that, relationship to the end of the world. When that happened two years ago, I think going back to what Bell said about how um, the Japanese culture, how people behave, there was, a, there was great support in the international fashion community for um, Japanese um, because, you know, they they're, they're very big on at lunchtime you all stop and you all eat together and you have yes. a real a real time you don't just you know carry on working at they, they don't carry on working at their computers with a yeah. sandwich or something that's interesting um, and uh and also a lot of like Aaron and Sachiko from black the designers black they work with japanese factories and they were telling me that um all the all the factories they worked with they're all family businesses where generations before have produced and and done manufacturing so even though they're quite small production designers they still felt um stroked by their factory and they didn't feel that if someone came with a big order that they would be prioritized because there's a very loving attitude in how they're supported right that's interesting yeah and they, they cared about the person making their clothing in that factory as much as that factory worker cared about them. There's mm. a very yeah. genuine, mm. yeah. you know, it's, it, it's not like the commerce in the West. Mm. Well, um, there was a, an article I read years ago about business in Japan where the Chinese, so they were interviewing some Chinese person, they said, oh, we don't want to do things in the same way as the Japanese, we just got rid of communism. Um, and they were sort of, you know, because Japan is a very, very equal society wealth-wise, mm. I think it's one of the most equal societies on the planet. So though there's mm. lots of very rich people mm. um, and there are some very poor people, really most people are in mm. a, a middle in a way that in London or New York isn't the case. So I guess that might be some of the reason why you've got closer relationship between the factories and, and the designers yeah. perhaps. Um, you've also, I mean, the family is very important in Japanese culture, and there's much more mixing of generations. There's a lot of respect for older generations, exactly, exactly, and and older traditions as well yeah. in the clothing. Yeah, and a, and a, and a respect for wisdom. Mm. Yes. You know, uh, uh, yeah. It's also interesting what you say about Fukushima because a lot of lot of the the, the big three Yamamoto, Ray, um, that they are post-war aren't they? And they were born in a post-war era and it had a massive effect on the national psyche. Um, and they had to really re-examine their relationships to parts of their own culture. I think there was a brand of Japanese feminism that started arising at that time. It was just, they had to relook at everything. It's fascinating. I don't know how Fukushima has, I mean, it's, it's such a tragic thing, but I don't know how that's affected it, but it, it will have had an effect mm. you know, on everything. Well, they have, um this, I don't know how relevant this is, but maybe, just maybe we can slip this in. But a very, very young woman wrote the Japanese constitution. She was, because not many people in America could speak Japanese. So she, I think she was 20, 21, the woman who wrote the Japanese constitution. So she slipped feminism in. So, um, 
because you know because like you do like you do <laughs> so although you know it's a very traditional society in some ways that might be some of the reason why some strong women could rise mm. um, you know so the second question is from another strong woman mm. in fact the her, her name has been written in the sort of flourish that I often see her name written in uh, she's so strong she's mind mind made the writing <laughs> um, and straight from the British countryside uh, Lady Amanda Harlick has sent us in a question Karl Lagerfeld's mute um, inspiration so <clears throat> do you think a designer should explain his work Junior is a man of cloth and construction mm. and emotion should he have to explain more or is this a Japanese sense of making not Word making, but explaining how. Making, w not I, word making. So, so how how do one explain it? Is that in words or is it in? No, is it in cloth? To justify. Well, I guess to justify what you do, or Amanda's I'd saying, do you have to explain your clothes in words, or do you just explain them in cloth? That's well, that all comes yeah. down to. Sorry. No, no, you. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that talking as a designer, I think that that all comes down to the whole sort of now with the, all the social media now with it, I mean, and all that kind of thing how much do you explain how much do one need to to sort of explain one's own work because sometimes it can be incredibly hard to put words onto what it is that one do in in in, in a very short <coughs> period of time like 30 mm. seconds explain what it is that you or i as a journalist will be bored by what it is that you're saying very very quickly where you as a designer probably live in a, in a bubble sometimes unfortunately and, and have a hard time putting words to what it is because you see things visually yeah. and, and visually sometimes hopefully should come through in what it is that you do uh, within your uh, uh, work and your collection so, so I, I, I sometimes find that words describing words for fashion can be misleading in, mm. in some kind of a way because mm. it's hard. What do you say? It, oh, mm. I mean, we've read a lot of time. It's a sexy mm. collection, but what does that mean exactly? What does a sexy collection mean? Because we all have a different version of what sexy collections are. Mm. Uh, but so that's a that's a vision from from a journalist point of view. I think so. As a designer, sorry, I'm rambling on. No, no, um, no, no this uh, is wonderful. I, f I think is is that I think that he explains it incredibly well. From my point of view, I think that I think that I I, I w I'll be intrigued to go and, <coughs> and 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 look at these garments, examine them, and see how are they made inside. Why are they great to put on? Why would I feel as it was sexy or uh, what, what what would they make me feel like as a human being when I put these garments on? And I think that that is the ultimate thing for for fashion and for a uh, fashion designer to do. Really, I don't think the ultimate thing is to describe yeah. it in words. Unfortunately, but I might be wrong. <laughs> no, Sorry. I don't know. Thank you. I <laughs> tend to really love explanation, and uh, there's a parallel with art. Sometimes you come across a piece of abstract art, and you look at it, and you go. Pfft that's very nice, um, but I don't know. And you look at the title and it says number four and you kind of go, what does that mean? And if the artist came and said, well, look, I'm trying to do this, it's a landscape, but I've abstracted it, it, it becomes a richer, I have a richer response to it. With clothing, it's different because it will become yours in a way. I mean, it's up to Junior whether he wants to explain stuff or not. Um, like you say, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to explain what you're trying to achieve. But, you know, you're going to put this on, this is going to be your thing, you bring your own interpretation. You have a gut reaction to something when you see it visually, like I have a gut reaction to, to this. And then if I was to own a piece, I would then have a different... It would almost be not entirely relevant, <laughs> what the designer is, because it's mine, and mine to make of, you know, in the way that I choose. So. Mm. It's up to him whether he wants to do, explain it or not, but I think it's clothing. Mm. Mandy? Well, I was going to say that, um, you know, you can't try it on. You see, this is where you're seeing it. This is where um, people are going to start influencing the whole industry. People that were at that show when they're Instagramming it, tweeting about it before the show's even started, the clues are there. The way that he's communicating that collection is the music that he's he's laying out, what you first see in the venue when you go in, um, 
his his runway some people put down carpet on the runway i mean there's loads yeah. of ways of communicating what you the show notes as yeah. well i mean traditionally if you're at what we call an international show you wouldn't explain your collection in words um, I remember one of the designers I worked with, Jay Maskery, she used to have a poem, which I thought was lovely. So while people were waiting for the show, there'd be a poem. And it wasn't a random poem, it was a poem that maybe inspired the collection, but mm. it wouldn't give any clues away. Mm. It was just a mood that she was setting. Mm. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it is sad in shows and people keep saying about, oh, how long can the runway go on for? Um, you can't keep having up down on a runway, you can't touch the fabric, you can't see it. How maybe in film, which is probably why Show Studio is so successful, is in, in movement on in film you can home in on the detail and people, people often say, well it's in this digital age, maybe people should do movies or stop animation or whatever and, and the runway is irrelevant to that, but actually he is commu communicating as best he can. What more can he do? And I think that if someone has to explain what they do, I, I mean, personally for me, if I ever have to exp justify or explain what I'm doing, I know that I shouldn't be doing it. D do you know what I mean? When we, um, we want clothes to be silent communication. I mean, that's the point of wearing them. I, I mean, otherwise, otherwise there would be no point in spending money on clothes. Uh, you know, uh, I've broken my glasses and uh, I said to, I said to people here, I said, oh, I've broken my glasses. And somebody said, uh, well, surely it doesn't matter. It's what you're saying that matters. And I was like, but it's fashion. <laughs> How I can can't I see. I, 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 well, no, because <laughs> I have this terrible pair of uncle glasses. Which you are, are brilliant. <laughs> which Jack are, Duckworth. Um, you know, they're like, they're just one look removed from being cool. If they were frameless, then I'd wear them. But they've got a metal frame around them and they accentuate the line between my eyes. But like, um, but yeah, and, and, and so, you know, you want, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, I desperately need designers to be able to explain their clothes. If a designer... Yeah, but would you desperately need them to understand what you're putting out there? I think that might be the issue. Well, I'm saying that you it's know. a contradiction. My, yeah. my journalistic need mm -hmm. and uh, Amanda's friend Carl's amazing ability to give a journalist everything they've ever wanted is opposite to actually what you want clothes to do. You want clothes to silently talk to you. But I think that's the genius thing of having a show. I think, you know, that's, it's, a, it's gonna sound very romantic to say this, but it's about conveying an emotion through the music, through mm. the, how styling. you experience it, through the styling, you know, like such, such a massively important thing, you know, the styling mm. and the hair and how it's presented on a catwalk. It's about a designer, I think, uh, a lot of the time a designer you know has worked on a collection for six months so it comes to the end of a collection and they're absolutely exhausted by it you know mm -hmm. they've seen it every day they you know that all the references have been around them for so long that when it comes to that point of like okay explain it now it's so difficult for them to do that which is one of the reasons why it's so important to have a stylist I yeah. mean a lot of designers style their own shows mm. and I completely respect them for that and and there are advantages but actually when you've been with that collection so long having someone from the outside that's coming in fresh mm. and challenging you with their thoughts and on how you should present it is very mm. very healthy mm. I think also it'd be good for Peter to talk about what you did at the Hepworth in Wakefield, right. that amazing um, uh, gallery, um, because again, we're talking about up down with shows and everything. But you did this incredible project with them. Uh, yeah, I did. Yes, with uh, with the Hepworth uh, Gallery, because we we based the collection on Barbara Hepworth. So that was the uh, uh, muse, or whatever <laughs> she was for that that season, and and we got invited to show the collection up there amongst her art pieces. Uh, which was great because it was so great to see my my work amongst this humongous brilliant art and then that made you realize how small your little fashion thing is and and mm -hmm. and what what that sort of the discussion of is mm -hmm. art fashion and fashion art and blah 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 and all that uh, uh, that really sort of put it's certainly for me it, into perspective of, of what it what it all was I think and and I was just it was such an, a great it was really a great 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 thing but did the press to, to, uh, did the, the press, press loved it yeah did they go there yeah they it's did it's outside London yeah they did wow that's good yeah they did they <laughs> came <laughs> it was outside London it was outside no, no, the North Circular you were talking <laughs> you were talking about the press experience and I was thinking well actually when Chanel did their 
pre-collection in uh, Dallas. Mm. Yeah. You know, the press have flown out there, yeah. they have all the whole, pro they even visited South Fork on the next day. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what's not to love? Yes. <laughs> if we're talking about, if we're talking about <laughs> things like, you know, because Junya has chosen quite a traditional venue for what is a traditionally inspired collection with very strong punkish elements. What did you feel that the Barbara Hepworth lent to your clothes? What, what was the dialogue there in a way? Well, the dialogue was to see the model walking around her art piece in, yeah. in the rooms of what the architectural, uh, how, how they did built this uh, museum for, for her work. I, I've, it's hard to explain again. Mm. I mean, I'm no, just retarded yeah. probably, but, no, but, no, that, no, uh, but that, but that is, sort of, it was sort of, well, I, I very much like runways. I have to, I do, mm. and I, I think that it's a great show way of showing your your work, and it, it really does does mm. do something to show your work. The other thing that's really good about the catwalk show, yeah. which I like, is that it creates the narrative. You know, the designer has thought about this outfit next to this outfit next to this outfit. He's developing an idea in a kind of storyline, which you don't get so much in fashion film because you've got two or three outfits. But that's so opposite to. You know, because I was wondering about this question the other day, and I'm really glad it's come up, so I'm going to put it so you can all talk about it. You know, when you're wearing the collection, um, are you wearing the show? No. no. But, but we all talk and dissect as if you are. It's a different experience of fashion looking at a catwalk show and then wearing the piece. But, you know, like yesterday we had somebody sat in the pan no, um, our, the RAF panel, and, and just, you know, he said, oh, you know, I can't hear the music, I can't judge the clothes. And just, I mean, look, I totally take the show on board when I'm dressing, right? But just to be awkward, I said, well, you can't hear the music when you're walking down the street. So mm. why do you need to hear the music to judge it? So, I mean, I, I'm really interested in all of your opinions on that. Um, okay, so we've just watched the show, they're not moving, we can't hear the music, <laughs> uh, we can't touch the fabrics, but it's one experience, isn't it, of, we're, we're, res we're, we're responding to visuals here in this context, um, and that's valid. If we're there on the front row, we hear the music, we're shuffling around next to someone, um, that's a valid experience. It's different, but it's valid. If we go backstage, we try on the jackets, we feel things, we chat to the model, that's another experience but it's equally valid. It's just like recognizing that, you know, you can have a different experience of something um, and it's still important. Mm. It's amazing, isn't it? After no, the that shows, makes, when yeah. you put it like that, it, it's very, it's very sensible. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say that after the shows, it's quite interesting. I always feel sorry for the designer because people like you are asking them about the collection one after the other. And, and something else that's really weird is someone um, will record an interview on a microphone and then the next journalist will come up and they're almost recording their private little words. I've done and that. I, I think that's a bit, <laughs> a bit cheeky, but yeah, <laughs> with the time constraints, you, have, have, to, to. you have to do that. But I feel sorry for the designers because um, they're having to regurgitate all the, you know, this snapshot, yeah. the journalist is in a rush to get to the next show, what have you. It's, it's crazy backstage all, all times. But really Tim though. Blanks is quite interesting because he's the only one that I ever see who takes the designer over to the rack and says, right, what's this? And yeah. it really gets into the nitty gritty um, rather than just ask some questions from what they've just seen. Is it, he has the benefit of getting that time with them as well. Is it delusional? Is it delusional when I wear a piece of uh, clothing from the cat? You know, uh, Rob, you are Mr. Music Fashion. You're, you're okay. doing great work at defining the relationship between music and fashion in London right now. Um, you know, is it delusional when you buy a piece to sort of be hearing the catwalk music as you walk down the street? I think if it is, that's absolutely fine. I think it's meant to be a fantasy. Let it, let it be what it is. Let it be what it is to the individual, what you're saying about levels of how you experience it you know when you go to album listenings and things like that like the the lights are taken down slightly it's meant to be an experience you know you listen to a 12 track album it's it's how each journalist takes that sound in themselves you know the same with the show it's and the same with how we sit here and watch it i think it's mm. how an individual takes it and if they want to hear the show cat when they walk to the street if they hear it to their own soundtrack absolutely fine I think it's it's 
I, I have always loved fashion and pop culture for that exact reason. It's meant to be a fantasy. It's meant to excite you. It's meant to, you're meant to be able to escape with it. You know, it's kind of something that's meant to inspire you and push you forward and make you to want to do more. And if you walk down the catwalk and you hear the soundtrack as you're going to a job interview, great. Like, go and do it, you know, go, like, let that be exactly what it is. I think that's hilarious because Roxanne's last show, she had Moni Love, It's a Shame. I can't imagine any of her customers <laughs> going out, <laughs> hearing that track as they're, <laughs> as they're leaving their front door. I mean, I never <laughs> remember the music for the show when I'm getting ready. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, at the Craig Green show, I can't remember what the track was, but it was an 80s track. And I was sat behind Sarah Mawa, and I noticed, obviously she was also enjoying the fashion, but when this track came on, she got all coquettish. <laughs> like, it's sort of like, like there was a lot, uh, you could tell she was glowing. Yeah. And I thought, oh yeah, that's very clever. Aim your, aim your music at the uh, the powerful people in the audience. <laughs> I don't think that was a tactical move. <laughs> no, uh, I think but it's Hillary very Alexander's very good. Hillary Alexander, she's fantastic guest at a show. She really gets in the groove. Whatever the music, she's <laughs> she really gives it her all, and she's and enjoying it genuinely. Yeah. <laughs> and Tim's a ex music journalist, so he's always he always knows exactly what the music is, knows the reference, no matter how sort of obscure they are. And I think that's amazing. And like when we're working with Sean Sampson, like he has such a massive, his collections are so influenced by music. You know, it's the, he's been brought up on kind of uh, it's a specific type of music. And like I remember when we did uh, when we did Master Race, and we sent out like we sent out models to that, and it's such an aggressive bass. No, line. but that mm. they had real problems at the Royal Opera House when that Master Race track. It's got a really heavy bass line. And actually, it nearly cracked the windows. Yeah, like, I mean, there was a proper issue with that, um, with the music at that. But show. the guys, the music, the music production hate me because I'm a nightmare. Because I arrive in the morning with the music, and I'm like, no, more bass, more bass. Like, mm. I stand there doing the levels, literally, because it's exactly like we say about an emotion. You know, mm. you, you want to hit people with it. I remember talking to a young designer whose name I've forgotten. I feel really bad, but she said if she wanted to design a particular kind of fabric design she would actually have loud pumping music mm. and if it was quieter she'd turn it down a bit maybe there's a bit of Mozart so you know it probably has an influence in creation as well as well as reception. So. I interview a lot of fashion designers for blogs and stuff and one of my common questions mm. is oh what do you listen to when yeah. you're working and yeah. you know everyone has their own soundtrack no one has ever turned around and says oh no don't listen to me I don't I, you know just do anything yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 silence that would be true. Peter as a, oh. as a designer what's your relationship to I music? listen to women's hour <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, how does that influence you did they walk around the Hepworth did they walk around the Hepworth gallery in complete silence because Comedy Garson yeah. actually has had complete quiet shows before and it's, it's quite really shocking. weird being yeah. at a quiet yeah. show. Every yeah. The audience is completely uncomfortable. Yeah. It's really mm. quite unsettling. <laughs> no, no, we did have music. I can't remember what it was. I have to admit. But that's interesting that you're a, a verbal designer as opposed to a musical one. Oh, no, but I do listen to music as well, but it, it's probably not cool or, or anything like this. It's ABBA. I love Summer Night City. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> but there's this line in it where it goes, "Grab." Gr um, I just know it's time to go, but for ages I thought it was grab your snow, it's time to <laughs> exactly, go. Exactly, that's what I, I thought do. was a reference to white things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, closing comments on the show. Um, I d you're all so fabulous, I don't know which one to ask to start closing. So, um, Mandy. Please help me. Oh, I was just going to continue from what Belle said about the editing of the, of the show and communicating your show in this snapshot that is your seasonal runway show. And, um, you know, when this show started, I was thinking, oh, yeah, this is typical. It, for me, it's not as strong as the women's, mm. but I'm being completely subjective. Um, but actually, the running order was really tight and it kind of reached a crescendo mm. and, and it came alive. And I think it it's it's... It's great. Mm. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great show. I don't like the ties, but that's neither here nor yeah. there. But I, I, I really like it, and I, and I, I actually really like looking at menswear because I, I love that kind of 
rule book that men's that you that you work within when you do a menswear collection. I think that that's great. It's not you have to don't you don't have to digest as much as you do with a women's wear collection. I've, but I, it's I more challenging because of that as well. Right. Mm. Well. Yeah. Exactly. You like discipline, don't you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm very. You don't seem you don't seem a sort of discipline fan. Oh really? Oh yeah. no, you do. I think. You um, seem so cuddly and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> you can be disciplined and cuddly. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that sounds kind of extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the show. I think maybe some criticism will be levelled at it for being quite similar to other menswear stuff that he's done before. But as a presentation, I really enjoyed it. I could see people wearing it. Um, I found it quite exciting. Um, that's that's it, really, visually. Lovely. The soundtrack Models was great, cute. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Brilliant <soundtrack>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I think it's great. I think I'm obviously speaking as a bit of a fanboy, so I think it's great referencing, it's clean referencing, really nice styling, and I can't wait to start buying it. <laughs> <laughs> fanboy, what will you buy? The denim. The denim. Fantastic. Straight for the denim, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank so. you, panel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>